Uh, welcome, and thank you all for coming out on this grotesque evening. Uh, I'm Mark Crispin Miller. This is uh, the first Tuesday's talk for uh, September. And uh, the purpose of this series is basically to provide a forum for uh, the authors of books that uh, might be un unfairly overlooked or unjustly attacked. Uh, I'm pleased to say that so far there's no sign that either of those things is going to happen to uh, killing the cranes. Uh, so um, keep your fingers crossed. Um, Edward Day co covered Afghanistan, has covered Afghanistan for three decades. He started uh, shortly before the Soviet invasion of that country. So he really knows that territory and he knows that story. Uh, consequently, he's been able to write uh, an indispensable book for us, which offers us a nuanced and really heartbreaking view of uh, that front in the war on terror, and uh, is able to give us a perspective that has been sadly lacking, I would say tragically lacking. August, as some of you may know, was the deadliest month uh, yet for American soldiers, 66 of whom died in that, in that war. Uh, and this, you know, is the least of it. And all of that has everything to do with uh, the crudest uh, uh, version of the truth that one could possibly imagine. Uh, a very, very simplistic an inflammatory uh, story of Afghanistan's role in 9-11 and, and so on. Now it's time, I think, uh, now that people are reconsidering uh, the Obama administration and other things, it's time for a sober reconsideration of Afghanistan. And I can't think of anyone better equipped to give that to us than uh, Edward Girardet. He will talk about his book for a little bit, then take your questions. And I'm going to say now what I'm going to say again at the end. Uh, this is an independent bookstore. This is a book published by an independent press, a small press, Chelsea Green. Therefore, you really should consider buying a copy. Uh, you should buy a copy of the book uh, and support a number of worthy ventures. And he will reward you by signing your copy. So uh, please join me in welcoming Edward Girardet. Thank you so much. That, that was a great introduction. And also, you've got a great fan here for small or large bookstores. It doesn't matter. And um, I think it's indispensable we keep them going. Uh, but And also small publishers such as Chelsea Green. I, I, was, I have to admit, I was a bit disappointed when I couldn't find a major publisher. And uh, one of them, Knopf, was interested. But they said, we have a book in Iraq coming up, so we don't need another one with one of those countries. And uh, but I, I then met a friend who said, well, actually, probably nowadays it's best to go with a small publisher because they're the ones who will actually put in commitment. They won't remain your book after two weeks. And uh, they'll also stick with you for a couple of years. And this is precisely what uh, Chelsea Green has been doing. I mean, they've been extraordinary putting me on God knows how many radio programs, uh, which I was, I was doing. I got in Sunday evening and... Um, I've been put on, you know, probably every day for the past 10, 12 days, four or five programs a day. Uh, NPR syndicates, independent radio stations, um, networks, and some with very, very good questions. And I think that's that's uh, excellent. Um, I thought I'd just talk a bit about why why the book. Um, I first went out. Uh, this is all in the book. Uh, I first went out uh, three months prior to the Soviet invasion in October '79. When and I have to admit this, I was a young foreign correspondent in Paris, and I was looking for a war. And I have to put it that way, uh, shamefully, but that was the case. And I think you know most young journalists that you know I kept hearing all these tales from foreign correspondents who'd covered Vietnam or then doing Salvador, Congo, and of course I was based in Paris, so all the major photo agencies, Magnum, SIPA, Sigma. They were all based out of Paris, and these photographers would come back with their silk scarves and mm. describe how they had just got back from Salvador and you know liberated a bottle of wine from some shot up, shot up uh, store or um, uh, and so on. And I just thought this was the greatest thing. And um, so a friend of mine from Time magazine, 
who had covered Vietnam, and uh, William Dowell, uh, who's also featured in the book, uh, although he's somewhat embarrassed, but you can read that. Uh, he was totally unfit when he went in. Uh, he said, look, you know, there's this little war beginning to emerge in Afghanistan. You may want to go and check it out. And he also, remember at the time he was saying, I mean, he's a very experienced journalist. He said, um, you know, we cannot ignore these small conflicts because we don't know what will happen, what they may become. And they need good reporting from the very beginning. So that's how I went out. And of course, then I realized that I should not really call myself uh, for a, a war correspondent. In fact, one thing you learn very quickly, I think, covering conflicts, and I was very fortunate to be able to report for the um, Christian Science Monitor, and my editors gave me a lot of space. Um, and you realize that wars do not stop when the fighting stops. Wars continue for years on end. Uh, the impact of war with Afghanistan, for example, the destruction of irrigation canals, of villages, farms, um, the trauma. You know, we always forget about war trauma. And I think it's also quite pertinent just taking the, the subway here, seeing, you know, various centers about the, those who've suffered uh, from 9-11, uh, their trauma. I mean, every country goes through trauma. And this is something we need to remember that, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're from Somalia, Afghanistan, New York, um, you ordinary people suffer from trauma. And um, my wife was always convinced that I suffered from trauma as a journalist. She says, well, you know, how do you journalists manage to see all these things, um, horrific things, and yet you manage to keep going? And uh, which I thought was a very good question because, um, you know, I, I did cover a great deal in Somalia, which actually for me has been some of the most horrific uh, stuff that I've seen. But Afghanistan in a way was different because First of all, from the media point of view, it was probably the last war which I think was properly covered. Uh, in the sense that we didn't have satellite phones, or we did have satellite phones, but they were too expensive to use. Uh, they were too big. And which meant that you as a journalist had to go into Afghanistan uh, by foot for three, four, five, six weeks at a time. You couldn't report, you just took notes. You stayed in villages, you walked, we walked 12, 14, 16 hours a day. And it became so exhausting sometimes that, you know, I would either travel with the French doctors, uh, Ed Medical International or MSF, uh, or I travel with one or two journalist friends. We always try to travel together just for safety reasons. And we had this rule that um, when you arrived in the evening, one of you would be the designated speaker to the elders of a village, because you came and they put you up, you might sleep in the mosque, you might sleep in the village. Uh, and then of course, along came all the elders. And that meant four hours of talking. And you were absolutely exhausted that so one of you had to talk and the others would pretend to be listening and were actually trying to sleep. And, um, but what it did, it put you in touch on a daily basis with the population, you know, you went through the fields, you learned I mean, the women weren't covered in the fields. This is something relatively new over the past 30 years with the refugee camps when all the refugees were tightly compressed in these refugee camps. So of course the women had nowhere to go uh, and they had to wear cover, but in the fields they didn't have to. So you learned when you arrived to just avert your eyes and not to be looking directly at them because that was an insult. Uh, although sometimes you did commit adultery uh, just by, I mean, I remember once this old man, old, my age, <laughs> who came down with a donkey and his new wife of 16 on the back, and she was c covered like here, and I looked at her, and the man had already passed me, and I winked, and I could see she had this huge grin behind her cover, so I had committed adultery. And, but I thought, that's great, you know, and she was obviously amused. Um, but what it meant was that when you came back, you had your notebooks full, you had time to actually contemplate what you'd witnessed, and then you wrote your series or your pieces. So I think the reporting was of a much, much better quality um, because you just had time to do it. I think with the first Gulf War, that came to an end because a lot of the journalists, particularly those in television, had to report the moment they hit the ground running, and which meant they didn't have time to report. 
And I think that's one of the big tragedies today. If you look at Afghanistan today, a lot of the reporters go out, uh, and I'm not, you know, I'm not criticizing my colleagues. It's just that a lot of them spend all the time or only see the military go embedded with the military. I try to avoid that because I, I, I feel very strongly that we should be doing what happened during the Vietnam War, where journalists could get up in the morning, go catch a plane, go somewhere, cover something, come back. They were honorary majors, which meant they had the right to go to the officer's mess, they could get on any aircraft, and they were not being cared for by the, cared for by the military. Uh, nowadays, you can't do that. You have to sign up, you have to sign contracts uh, with the military, you're not allowed to just go off on your own. And I find that a, a form of control, uh, which, you know, they argue, well, we have to protect you. But uh, interesting enough, that was the same argument that the fundamentalists the, during the resistance years, like Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, Hezbi Islami, I would, they would always say, why don't you come with us? Why do you go with the other groups? And I had been with them. And I said, I'll go with you, but I have to have the right to leave your group and go on to another group. I don't know, we can't do that because we have to protect you. So it was a very similar argument. I found ironic. Um, so the reporting we did during the 80s was crucial, and I think what is needed today in order to understand what is happening in Afghanistan today, you have to go back to the Soviet war. In fact, ideally, you should go back to the 19th century when the British uh, went in, uh, conducted three war two wars in the 19th century, one in the 20th century, the Anglo-Afghan wars, did a lot of the same mistakes. And then you can also, if you really want to be serious, go back another 2,000 years. Uh, but let's try and stick to the past 30 years. Um, because what happened, I think, uh, in the 1980s was that, and this is what I tried to do with the book, I wanted a book to respond to two questions. One was the question of my father-in-law, who is a doctor, a retired doctor in Oregon. And he said, I just want to read a book that tells me and explains to me about Afghanistan, and I want to know what the hell we're doing in Afghanistan. And then I had my two interns from Tufts University who said, we just want to know how you got into Afghanistan, how you got into this work and the adventure. And they were more interested in that. So I tried with the book to do a combination of adventure, of personal experience, of analysis, of humor. I hope there's some humor in the book. Um, but just to try and convey uh, an impression of the country because Afghans are an extraordinary people. And some of the questions I've been getting is, you know, from people saying, well, you know, but Afghans are terrorists and this and that. And I said, no, it's like any country. You know, we, we had the Oklahoma bombings. It doesn't mean that every, you know, white American is, is an extremist. Uh, and, you know, it's people are people and people are tired of war. And most, you know, the overwhelming majority of Afghans are tired of war. And they are an extraordinary people. And they're very diverse people. And they're infuriating as a people sometimes. But this is all part of the overall picture to understand who Afghans are. And one little story, uh, which I'm not even sure, which I think I had to take out of the book because I had to cut 60,000 words before it went to press. Um, we journalists were always frustrated with Mujahideen during the 80s. Or, and also during the 90s when working with Afghans, because they would say, we're leaving tomorrow morning at 4, we'll come and pick you up. And by 7, you were sitting there stirring yet another cup of tea and waiting for someone to turn up. They never did. And then they would finally turn up three days later with no explanation. And I met this, I went to talk at the military academy in Kiev in Ukraine, and I was talking with several officers who had been to, to Afghanistan. This was during the 90s. And one of them said, you know, it was so frustrating working with the Afghan army because they never turned up on time. You know, we'd prepare a big operation and these guys would turn up three days later. And I said, well, I think we had the same, <laughs> the same problems in many ways. But during the 80s, the, the principal reason, uh, for, because of Brzezinski and under the Reagan administration, was that we were there to give the Soviets a hard time. But the US relied almost completely, the CIA relied almost completely on Pakistan, the ISI, the, the inter-services um, intelligence, the military intelligence of Pakistan for their information. And everyone 
whether Ira Iranians, Chinese, Pakistanis, Americans, British, you can go down the line. Everyone is or was in Afghanistan for their own agendas. Not for the Afghans, but for their own agendas. And Pakistan clearly has its own agenda. Although, when the government in Islamabad says, we didn't know that, they're probably right. Because no civilian pop uh, politician is going to really criticize ISI. They don't last very long if they do. ISI is a state within a state, and probably a state within a state within a state. There are components of ISI that are rogue, that are still doing their own thing, nothing has changed. And throughout the 1980s, we ended up at the behest of the Pakistanis, supporting extremists such as Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, uh, and we ignored a lot of the inside commanders who were good. There were probably 20 or 30 really good inside commanders. These were commanders like Masood, uh, Abdul Haq, uh, Ismail Khan at the time, who were trying not to rely on the support provided by the Pakistanis or the Americans or the Chinese, but to try, they tried to remain independent. And that was one reason why the Pakistanis did not want to work with them, because they, the last thing they wanted were independent commanders. They wanted the commanders to toe their line. And the Saudis were involved, and, you know, bin Laden was involved, but to remember that bin Laden at the time was also just one of many uh, Afga uh, uh, outside foreign uh, Islamic legionnaires, jihadists, who came for their own reasons. They, they didn't come to really help the Afghans, they came for their own jihad. Uh, and they also were very arrogant, disdainful of ordinary Afghans, and the Afghans did not like them. Uh, and in fact, in the early 1990s, the Afghans, they kicked out the, the Arabs. Uh, they were, came back in again with the Taliban, but they did kick them out. There was, they did, there was no difference really uh, with Al-Qaeda, the Americans, the Europeans, the, the, the Chinese. For many Afghans, these were outsiders, uh, simply put. So. Um, a lot of the people we supported in the 1980s have become the monsters of today, like Gulbuddin. Others, like Haqqani of the Haqqani Network. Uh, Haqqani was actually a very good commander, but he became increasingly bitter during the 1990s uh, toward the U.S., and then he and his son established the Haqqani Network. And there were others who initially had fought the Soviets, were quite sympathetic to the West, but then changed, became more radical. And um, then came the bitter civil war of, um, uh, of Kabul, uh, the Pakistanis pushing Gulbuddin to take the city. The Americans had dropped Afghanistan like a hot potato, which meant that they had no, no more influence. And, you know, the, the mistakes go right down the line. They, there was, a, I mean, ironically, Gorbachev actually, when they announced, the Soviets announced the pullout, he actually felt, I think, to his credit, that there should be some sort of peaceful solution because he felt as well there would be war, which is exactly what happened. And of course, then the Taliban came in, and they came in because they offered order and security. People were tired of all this bickering, infighting, the, the insecurity. So the, the Taliban were actually quite popular in the beginning. But when they took Kabul in September 1996, then they began going for the minority groups, the Tajiks, the Hazaras, and brutally so. Uh, and then it became yet another civil war, incredibly brutal civil war. But what was interesting was that the Americans were also supporting the Taliban because of oil reasons. Uh, Cheney gave the Taliban $43 million in April 2001. And because of the, um, um, their supposed crackdown on narcotics, on uh, growing of opium, that's... A very open question, do they do that or do they just hedge it in order to have higher prices later on? So that's, that's an open debate. Um, but what was interesting in early 2001 and probably already in 2000, the Taliban or elements of the Taliban were already imploding. There was increased disenchantment amongst a lot of the Pashtuns with the dominance of the Pakistanis, the dominance of the Arabs, and they were increasingly ready to switch sides. And Abdul Haq and Masood were trying to build up this anti-Talib alliance in early 2001. Um, Mas Masood actually went to Paris in April, met with um, uh, American officials, warned them that there was an impending operation against the West, 
probably against the United States. He also warned against any uh, military intervention in Afghanistan. He said, we do not need military in intervention, but what we do need is pressure on the Pakistanis and the Saudis to stop supporting the Taliban. And he reckoned that within a year, the Taliban would have collapsed. They were upheld by a lot of money coming in, not just Al-Qaeda, and you know, it was a faction in a civil war. I, that's, I, I make the point that Al the, the Taliban were not a terrorist organization. They were one faction in a civil war, and they were very Afghan. They would take support from whoever gave it to them. And you know, if you compare the Mujahideen with the Taliban, they were very similar, and they operate very similarly. Uh, the, Tal the Mujahideen in the 1980s were considered terrorists by the Soviets. They were supported by a whole gamut of countries or groups such as the US, China, Iran, Pakistan, uh, Kuwait, I mean, you go right down the list. Um, they kept, people kept changing sides. Um, then back again in, the, in 2001, no one was prepared, the United States and Britain uh, and the French, although unofficially the French listened, but the, gov the, the president didn't. They, there was this new anti-Talib alliance in the making. And when Massey was killed uh, in, on September 9th, uh, 2001, there were several reasons, probably. One was that Al-Qaeda was giving a present to the Taliban. He was the last significant commander to uh, stop the Taliban from advancing. Uh, secondly, um, it may have been linked to the events of 9-11. I think indirectly it was. Thirdly, Al-Qaeda was very aware that the Taliban were in the process of collapsing and uh, that people didn't like them. And I think probably only the senior leadership, 20 or 30 people, because, you know, the Taliban means scholars, but they, um, most of the Taliban were illiterate and are illiterate. And they probably couldn't give a damn what happens or happened beyond the borders of Afghanistan. Uh, these were very conservative tribesmen and they, they had their own reasons. Um, so there was this, this front in the making, this alliance in the making, and Abdul Haq tried desperately, uh, and this is not in the book, unfortunately, I had to remove a lot of that material, but uh, there's actually another very good book by Lucy Morgan Edwards called The, um, the Afghan Solution about Abdul Haq, which goes into a lot of detail about this. The, he was pleading, literally, with the Americans, with the CIA, and with MI6, and there were meetings which were taking place, uh, not to bomb. And he was totally ignored. Uh, there were a small group of diplomats, American diplomats, uh, European diplomats, who were trying to say to Washington and London, look, pay attention to this, this, this could be good. But the, given the events of 9-11, the emotion in the States, the anger, the seeking of revenge, um, the decision was made to bomb in order to have fireworks, basically. It was, and I think it was probably the most absurd decision. And I remember being in the States just afterwards, and I'd written for the Monitor a piece about this, saying that if the bombing begins, it will create a whole new slew of bin Ladens, except there'll be Afghan and bin Ladens. And the moment the bombing began, that basically turned all these tribal Pashtuns who were thinking about changing sides uh, into digging their heels in again. So I think the bombing actually led to a new war in Afghanistan. I think they could have gone in with, the, the intelligence was there, they could have gone in and probably arrested or taken out whatever language you want, you want to use. Um, the 20 or 30 senior Taliban or the, uh, the various Al-Qaeda, I mean, they, they, knew, they knew where Bin Laden was. I mean, there was no question about that. That was all available, except a lot of the people who the CIA roped in were playing both sides, and the, the ISI was involved. And when the bombing began, by the way, for three days, the US, much to, to the disgust of some of the special forces people, gave ISI three days to remove all their people. And ISI, the Pakistanis were providing, I mean, the Pakistani Air Force was providing uh, air support to the Taliban, and they had to be out. So, you know, the double game went on right to the end, and it was basically a political decision which has been disastrous. And then after that, you know, one mistake after another was made. Um, I think in, in post-2001, there were a lot of people with experience, a lot of 
very good aid agencies, the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, um, CARE International, uh, the Swedish Committee for Afghanistan, Madeira, a French agricultural group, a lot of them had had years of experience in Afghanistan. Uh, CARE has been there, for example, for, for 60 years, um, Asia Foundation. A lot of these people, and I myself, were, were involved in talks organized by the Council for Foreign Relations about what to do with Afghanistan. And I think the common message by most of these people was that go slow, don't throw money at Afghanistan, don't expect quick fixes. Quick fixes do not work in Afghanistan. Expect a 20 or 30 year recovery program. Focus on the rural areas where the majority, up to 80% of the population live. Do not make the mistake of rebuilding Kabul into this big city, which then attracts everyone to come in as workers and looking for work. Focus on the countryside. This did not happen. Uh, I mean, there were, they were, obviously there were some groups that um, tried to do this, but foreign contractors were brought in who had no commitment to Afghanistan whatsoever. Some of the foreign contractors were good, but I would say the majority of the big companies had no real interest. They did not talk to local communities. A lot of the aid groups did not have, and still don't have, uh, mercenaries or armed security guards. They rely on local contacts. They talk to everyone. They talk to the Taliban. They talk to local communities. They talk to NATO. They, I mean, they talk to everyone, which is their best means of protection. Uh, guards, armed guards, do not protect you. Uh, now, obviously, having said that, um, it's, it's become much more dangerous. And we did have the tragedy last summer uh, with the, the murder and uh, execution of uh, a group of aid workers, American, uh, European, and Afghan, by people we don't know who did it. And I think one of the problems is that uh, there's been confusion now between the military and the aid workers. Um, the fact that we have PRTs, provincial reconstruction teams, which I've always felt was a huge mistake. You cannot ask soldiers to become aid workers. And it's unfair to the soldiers as well. Um, you have to differentiate between the two. And I think this confusion is thrown everyone into the same cauldron. It's changed the whole landscape completely. It's much more dangerous today. I mean, Afghanistan is incredibly dangerous today. I felt relatively safe during the Soviet war of walking through the mountains in the, at the height of the Soviet war. I'm nervous now. I'm, I still walk wherever I can. And you, you have to, but it's, it's still a risk. I think you're safer walking. The whole international community, the whole, a lot of the embassies, the big international organizations are now in these compounds. The walls get higher by the day and they've lost contact with the country. And I think this in the long run is disastrous. If you, the moment you lose contact with the country, you, you're lost. And I think these are the problems we, we're now facing. Um, I think I'll probably stop there uh, and just open up to questions. I hope that was. <laughs> what questions? Yes. I'm uh, Steve Rodriguez, and I've uh, spent a lot of time over in Afghanistan with the US government. And one of the. <clears throat> One of the challenges that I've seen, and I agree and understand your points at the end, the problem with aid organizations, whether they're focused on uh, infrastructure rebuilding like Harmonix or uh, with the IAP or, or IRD or whatever, or groups like CARE, what I've seen is that they're not really linked in to where the money is flowing from the US government, so they have to coordinate, and that's why the military or the intelligence community gets frustrated with them. The problem is obviously that we don't seem to have a, a politically viable solution in Kabul. So you have all these you have all these groups out there, and they're all they're all trying to coordinate. Meanwhile, they're operating in a fundamentally rotten environment. So I think even if you had a useful solution, right? If there was less money, then that would destabilize, and it could be a good thing. But I would argue that would even that would bring about the destabilization of the Karzai Kars regime uh, even faster. Well, I, I think one of the problems is that. Um, unfortunately, I think that's the military has no role there. I, I think, and we should not be asking generals to do development. <clears throat> that's basically it. We should be, we should have gone in there, I think, and said it's going to take 30 years. It's going to be slow. 
but you've got to develop the the, the um, local relations. And one of the big problems, like the Kabul to Kandahar Road, is a very good example, where the Americans, who originally built the road, the Americans built the, the uh, sorry, the Russians built that road, the Americans built the east to west road, the the Russians the north to south, which served them better. Uh, but the fact is, they wanted an asphalted road, had to be redone. So they got a contractor to do it. And instead of taking four, five, six months, a year, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if it took three years, to go and talk to all the communities and say, this is your road, we want you to work on it, and not just work on it, we want you to maintain it. This has been the approach of the Aga Khan Foundation, which has been probably the most successful, uh, I mean, most successful, it's the, it's the wealthiest <laughs> uh, of the, um, the, the aid groups, they always involve the local population. So the result was that, and I talked to a US AID engineer about this, and I said, but if you don't drink tea with the people along the way, how can you provide security? And he said, we haven't got time. And I said, but that's rubbish. It doesn't matter if it takes a year. And why bring in bulldozers? You've got to involve the population. So the result is we have a beautiful asphalted road, which is useless. No one in their right mind is going to drive down this road nowadays. You can go in a convoy, you know, up to you. But it's not, so the problem is, we came in with all these contractors, we came in with the military, we thought, let's do it our way. Afghanistan doesn't work like that. And I just see, you know, I, I feel sorry for these soldiers because they, they're in an impossible situation. And a couple of weeks ago, I was at a wedding in, London, in England and I was talking to um, two Royal Marine officers who were heading back the next day to Helmand <coughs> and they were incredibly angry. They said, you know, we are political pawns now. This is a completely pointless war. We should have been talking 10 years ago with everyone involved. And that's what the Abdul Huxley of this world were trying to do. The institutions, despite being ravaged by years of war, are and were still there. And, but you know, I would go to the American Embassy and I talk to the ISAF and NATO and I wonder, are we talking about the same country? You know, and it's, I, I just think it's absolutely absurd. And um, what have we achieved? I think we've achieved zero. We have built bridges, which is fine. We've dug wells, and very often these wells are in the wrong places, because there's a reason why there were no wells there. The water cat there, the, the you know. So you have a lot of that, and I mean, I, I'm very, very critical of this this policy, and I I see pe you know people at the U.S. embassy, British embassy, German embassy, they're there for six to twelve month stints. You know, you can't even begin, and they can't get out. So how can you even talk about the country? And, you know, I was talking to one of the generals, and he said, well, we have intelligence saying this and that. And I said, but, you know, you know very well that your intelligence is bullshit, complete bullshit. You know, where are you getting it from? And he said, well, no, it is good, it is good. I said, you know, I hear this again and again and again. I said, you know, I know that when I'm away for more than two weeks, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> Yeah. So, is there an easy out? Oh no. <laughs> no, I, I think there no there no easy. I mean, it's and it's not a matter of an easy out. Mm -hmm. It's just how do you? We can't do it for them. Afghans have got to do it. Yeah. I think we can help them, but it's got to be on their own terms. And they're the ones who've got to assume responsibility. And you know, it, it, if and when the troops leave, the likelihood of a lot of insurgents moving in overnight is exactly what's going to happen. And it may not be a bad thing, uh, because some of these communities, the, you can't really use the term Taliban anymore, because there's so many different groups and individuals, and, and people are resisting or perceiving NATO, the US, and the international community as occupiers for different reasons. It's, the small farmer who was promised compensation, con compensation by the British in 2002 or three for um, destroying his poppy plants. He said, okay, and he never got compensation. <coughs> so you have a very angry farmer there. And not just that, it's put him in hawk with the traffickers mm -hmm. because he's got no money. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, there are and then every time there's a bombing, civilians get killed, a brother is killed, a mother is killed, a child is killed, it all builds up for whatever the reason. And 
you know, I think a lot, during the first three or four years, there was, there was, there was a lot of hope. I think people thought the war was going to end. And there's been a lot of disappointment. And, um, but I just think you, we just have to face the fact that it's, it's going to be a very slow process, but it needs to focus on the rural areas. We should stop trying to build Kabul into being this modern city. We should focus on the rural areas, you know. Um, and, you know, it's not going to be easy. We, we know that. So and, the well is dry. Well, it doesn't matter if the well is dry. Um, but I think, you know, we should still be, we shouldn't, you see the mistake we did in 1991, 92, was that we just dropped Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. I think we should still help them, but there's too much money. I mean, one of the vice presidents, Fahim, uh, from one of Masood's, I mean, I, I was a great admirer of Masood, who made many mistakes, but Fahim is a vice president, and he is an incredibly wealthy man. Mm -hmm. How is it that this man who had nothing, ten years, well, how is it? Uh, <laughs> Why, you know, he's worth hundreds of millions. Some say he's worth more than a billion. You know? Uh, could you give us some insight about President Karzai and his uh, brother and what his brother is <laughs> operating and doing? Well, I mean, Karzai, I mean, actually there's a guy, Nick Mills, who worked with Karzai and uh, he um, uh, wrote, wrote his speeches for him. And Karzai, would ch his moods would change by the day. Um, I think initially Karzai was probably not bad from the Western point of view. Very suave gentleman. He spoke well. English impeccable. He looked good. Uh, great to, to he, he was, as the Germans say, salon fähig. He was good for the salons. But he also had, didn't have much power, although he did, his family was very influential in Kandahar. And the family has done very well <laughs> out of this for a variety of reasons. And the, you see, the trouble is, I think, that we went in there and we roped in a lot of the warlords, a lot of the people who had become totally discredited before. I don't think Karzai was discredited uh, initially. He, he was someone who was favored. Um, and, but since then, you know, I think he's going kind of nuts now. Did he come out of the oil industry? Was he like an exec? Is that where? No, not not not, not him. No, he. Um, uh, I mean, that, that was that was more Khalizad, the American. I mean, that was also just briefly uh, appointing an Afghan American as the U.S. ambassador to Afghanistan was one of the most ludicrous decisions. You do not put a an Afghan national, which is what he was or what he is, as U.S. ambassador because every Afghan knows his baggage. They know exactly who he is, where he comes from, and who he favors. And, you know, Halizad had links with Unical, uh, with the oil. And uh, he also, um, I think one of the big disastrous uh, steps was that when he, they had the, the first lawyer, Jirga, in 2002, this big grand assembly, there was the possibility of bringing the king in, ex-king, Zayush Zayusha, Zayush who was not a great king, but for most Afghans, he represented a period of peace. It was nostalgic. And he had another four or five years to go. And he could have been a figurehead who could have rallied the country. But he and uh, Khalizad insisted on putting Karzai in. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's all up for debate. But uh, I think the king, as a figurehead, uh, if he'd been plonked there, and, you know, he wouldn't ma have made any decisions. But he probably would have rallied most Afghans. And there, there was probably a preparedness to spend the next three, four years. I mean, one possibility was having the UN. I mean, I mean, my wife works for the UN. I'm very critical of the UN. And the UN is only as good as we allow it to be. But the UN might have been the institution that could have overseen a transitional period of two, three, four years where there would be no elections, where there would be basically a, a, not a cooling off period, but a, a period when, when ordinary Afghans could have sighed and not have to worry about warlords coming. Time. Yeah, exactly. And then gradually say, okay, we can't have elections. Um, but by allowing the warlords into the Jirga in 2002, in June, they just let them all in. And that for many Afghans, and you know, I went out to Herat with, um, Ahmed Rashid, for example, and we talked to a lot of the women, and they were 
they were thoroughly enthusiastic about the elections. They thought, you know, this is great. We're going to have a say now. And they kept seeing, you know, they, they, uh, when I went out there, they were appointing delegates to the wire Jirga. And then they realized that as delegates, they had no say. And they were threatened, they were pressured, and the whole thing just became a mess. Yeah. Yes? I, I was interested in Masood before he was killed. And when he was killed, you know, it looked like a significant event in the world. And then, boom, right. it was 9-11. Um, when you described the three reasons why you thought he was killed, I didn't entirely understand the third one. But, I, but I, and I'd like you to explain that, but my question is a little bit bigger, which is about the, um, I, I understand that the Northern Alliance is now basically in shambles, mm -hmm. but what happened to those people? I mean, that was, that was a significant effort that went on from that part of the country, and it's still, mm -hmm. they're still there, right? So are they? We see Masood during the 80s yeah. was very highly regarded. He was one of the top guerrilla strategists. Uh, I mean, I would put him, and I, I, I say in the book that I think he was probably one of the greatest 20th century guerrilla strategists alongside, you know, Giap of North, yeah, Che. Well, Che wasn't a strategist, he was a, an icon. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And he was known as the Lion of Panjshir, he was very popular in, in Kabul. Right. Um, however, a lot of that changed. Uh, when the battle for Kabul began, uh, he moved in, and it's, it's a very interesting period. I, that's one of the reasons why I went up for National Geographic to try and see him in the first week of September 2001, because I wanted to sit down with him for three or four days, and he was very keen to do this. We were in contact with each other, uh, but he couldn't arrive uh, for various reasons, wind, too much wind for the, the helicopters. But he... Um, so you missed meeting him? I missed, I missed, well, I, I waited a week and then had to go back, because in fact it was my wife's birthday on September 13th, <laughs> and I wanted to be back for that, and I was, was making arrangements to come back but from the Taliban side, and then slip over eventually, because I, I just got a visa from the Taliban, so I thought I'll do that first, and then I'll sl slip across the lines. Uh, I'd already arranged that with the International Committee of the Red Cross to go in one of their vehicles and uh, cross. But the... Um, the, bat the, 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 Kabul, the Battle of Kabul was, again, a disaster because over 50,000 people died, mainly because of um, the shelling. But also when Masood had to intervene, and he actually didn't want to intervene straight away. He was hoping for a negotiated settlement with the, the, com the, the remnants of the communist regime, the PDPA regime, with, um, uh, with, with the president who... You know, we have to remember, all these people n know each other, knew each other. And uh, they, you may be enemies one day, but you can actually, you know, a cousin who knows him, and therefore you can actually arrange ways of talking. So there's always an open door somewhere for talking, and which is very Afghan, very important. I mean, I'm simplifying enormously, but... Uh, um, but the thing is, with Najibullah, they... He, the deal that was going to be made was that a lot of the PDPA, the former communist regime, and even using the word communist is absurd because a lot of people joined because of family links and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But they needed these people in the administration. And I think this is also what we've seen with Iraq, that you can't just kick everyone out and you're going to, you're going to have to compromise. And anyway, a long-term peace has to be based on a compromise involving everyone. What people didn't want, though, I think ordinary Afghans, were having war criminals and warlords who had committed atrocities during the Soviet period, during the, the, the Battle of Kabul period, during other periods, the Taliban. I mean, everyone has got blood on their hands. Um, and I think people, one of the basic concerns of most Afghans is to have some form of justice. And if you look at South Africa, you, you, know, you have to give that in one way or another. So, uh, but Masu did not want to intervene, but he had to intervene when Hekmati was about to take Kabul and being pushed massively by the Pakistanis. And also a lot of Kabulis were afraid of Hekmatyar because the guy was ruthless, is ruthless, and he's one of the leading insurgent politicians now. And, um, and Masu brought in his Panjshiris, and the trouble was 
that many of those around him, which we called the, the Panjshiri Mafia, were corrupt, did their own deals. And Masu did not have control over the Uzbeks, over Dostom's people. He did not have control of others. And it was a war. He shelled the Hazaras. And, you know, the sides kept changing. I mean, it was a, literally a merry-go-round of sides changing every two or three months. So, I mean, the Hazaras eventually came back to Masud's side because they were being persecuted by the Taliban. And, um, but, and they were generally in that region. They were, yeah, the, the, the Hazaras occupied the southwest of Kabul. Uh, and Hazaras have always traditionally been the, the underdogs of Afghan society. The, they're the ones who do the menial jobs. But during the Soviet war, they proved themselves to be extremely good fighters, which upset a lot of the Pashtuns because they were better than, I think, in many cases, the Pashtun fighters, uh, who tended to operate more locally or regionally. And, um, but the, but Masood, um, he recognized this, and um, I think he realized he had m made mistakes. and. I think he was generally not interested in becoming president. Um, he he saw himself as being a general. Uh, he he was fascinated by the military, and I, and I used to bring him books. He I'd, I'd come back from Angola, and he would question me for like three or four hours, saying, "Well, how do they operate this and that?" So we had these very interesting conversations, and uh, he even asked me once to bring some books from Switzerland because they had these uh, guerrilla warfare books, uh, you know protect the Swiss Alps. Right. And, uh, uh, and in fact, um, uh, he was very interested in the, on the outside. And one of the reasons why he brought the French doctors in is because he maintained girls' schools. He wanted health for everyone. And he was a modernist, but he knew how to work with the conservatives. Mm -hmm. So now, whether he would have been an ideal president or figure at the end, I mean, I, you can't win. I think he recognized that it had to be a broad alliance. And the two figures, I think, or the three possibly, Ismail Khan, who himself though changed, uh, he was in Herat. The two leading figures were probably Abdul Haq and Masood. And so they probably would have been able to form something which would have been much more nationalistic, uh, much more genuine, but it would have allowed Afghans to go at their own pace. You know, one thing which is very interesting, which I also mentioned the book is that originally a lot of Afghans rose up against the, the communist regime because they were being forced to send the girls to school. Mm -hmm. And Kunar, which is in eastern Afghanistan, highly conservative. And I was absolutely astounded. And this is where the fighting began. A lot of the fighting began in Nuristan and, and Kunar. Um, you go through the villages and every village has a girls' school. Uh, primary. Uh, I, there are a couple of secondary, but mainly primary. And this is because they'd been forced as refugees to send their kids to school by the Pakistanis. It was Pakistani law. And they realized the benefits of education. These are these highly conservative Pashtun tribesmen. Their girls were going to school. I mean, the ratio wasn't good, perfect. It was two-thirds boys, one-third girls. But this was a very traditional area, and it had changed. And Masood, his point was, you've got to work. You have to, it's like the old adage with a farmer. You don't take everyone, you take one farmer, and you work with this farmer, and then Ahmed looks over the wall and says, hey, how come his apples are so good? And he will then want the same thing. So that's basically how you've got, how you've got to work. But this is a, a long process. So I think Masood, he was a modernist, he was a nationalist. He, um, he was desperate toward the end, uh, but he was apparently willing to retreat over to Tajikistan and continue the war. And I was just fascinated, you know, how can you keep going after all these years? And, uh, but I think he, he and Abdul Haq, who were not the greatest of friends, but they understood each other, and I think they, they would have been prepared to work together. So I think that those were the two big lost opportunities uh, for a peaceful resolution. Mm -hmm. And right now, I don't see any Afghan who is astounding or could emerge. I, I mean, I, I don't know of anyone uh, right now, I'm sure there are some, but they haven't really come up. And is there any vestige of the Northern Alliance? Oh yes, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. They a lot of them are doing very well, thank you. And do they uh, have they've or is it just no, they're they're some are in the government, some are in positions. Uh, some have made a lot of money. Uh, some have opted out. Uh, one um, guy called uh, Mohammad Isak, who for a while ran the radio and TV in Afghanistan, was actually quite hard line but was a modernist at the same time. And he's so disgusted 
with the Northern Alliance, with the way also the Americans came in, that he just, he's, he stepped out, he's running a, a high-tech and IT firm in Kabul. Mm -hmm. uh, We've got time for one more. Yeah. I actually have three questions. I'll ask them into one. Um, you know, one, uh, why the title? Two, what about the opium? And three, is there hope in the future? Yeah. All right. Well, the title um, is actually. Uh, no, I'll tell you, it, it's it's in the front of the book, uh, three paragraphs. But it's. Um, I was talking to Masoud Khalili, who was one of the Afghans, very seriously, severely injured when Masoud was killed. He got over 200 pieces of shrapnel. He then became, when he recovered, he, he became um, Afghan ambassador to India. And I'd known him for many, many years. And I went to see him in 2004, in March, at his house in Kabul. He, he came from India just for two weeks. And we spent the whole evening talking about Afghanistan, the future, about responsibility, trauma of Afghans. And he, he said, well, you know, Afghans need to assume their responsibilities, but they are a nation of people traumatized and they need to think about what they're doing and where all this is going. It was quite a, quite a depressing conversation. And we, we went outside at midnight and looked up this amazing night sky. Um, and he said, you know, for me, the month of March was always the time when you couldn't hear the sound of your voice for the migrating cranes. And these are the Siberian cranes which, mi which winter in, in the wetlands of southern Afghanistan, there's some wetland areas. Uh, or eastern Afga southeastern Afghanistan, Baluchistan, and Iran. And then they migrate back to Siberia and northern Russia uh, in March, uh, April. And then he, he turned to me and said, you know, I haven't heard a single crane since being here. And then he said, have we even killed all the cranes? And I just thought, you know, that is such a, a moving observation. And I just thought, that's a, that's a book title. <laughs> No, so that I, even before doing the book, I had that as my title. No, no one believed me. They said, oh, "I can't. That's a corny title," you know. So, <laughs> and maybe just jumping, uh, the narcotics is that's quite a complicated issue. Basically, there's no one crop that can replace it. But I think what you have to do is a basket of improvements. But it comes down to just basic development. I mean, if you if you're a farmer and you're growing wheat, which has an almost similar price to opium, not quite, and it depends what, you know, goes up and down. Uh, basically, say you're a farmer and you grow wheat as your cash crop, you have to bring it down to the market, which means you've got to hire some mule from donkeys or camels or horses to carry your crop. That's very expensive. If you're growing opium, you put it in a small bag and you walk down. So basically, you're looking at extension work, and the, the traffickers are fantastic agriculturalists. They give credit, they give extension advice, they give fertilizer, and uh, they, they, that's the way we should be running the whole agricultural scene. Um, so, but again, this is, you know, farmers are no different whether they're in Canada, Australia, Afghanistan, Kenya. A farmer wants a good price for what he grows and wants to have, be able to live. So you basically have to have a development or investment program which enables, you know, have good irrigation if you need ir irrigation, access to your markets, um, transport. Uh, I mean, a lot of it's very basic and maybe a diversity of crops. Um, and there are all different options. I mean, there have been reports and reports and reports done. Um, but it's huge business. I mean, but Afghans only get uh, $3 billion out of the drug trade for Afghanistan itself, $194 billion go elsewhere. So they're actually getting this much. And, uh, but that's a, a whole different issue. And as far as the future is concerned, I think um, I'm, I'm optimistic, but I'm always, always optimistic. <laughs> I, the, I think it's just a matter of, not just a matter of, it's, it's going back to the basics. We have to go back to, to where we were and maybe in, in 2001, but bearing in mind what happened and try and work with lo local communities. And it's a very laborious process, but I think there's enough experience on the ground. There are a lot of aid agencies um, that can do it. It may mean very small projects. And you know, one of the, I mean, CARE, the head of CARE was telling me, he said, we can't do projects more than $100, $150 million. We just, we don't have the means. 
And of course, the companies will say, sure, we'll do anything. $800 million, we'll do it. And they really can't do it because they want to get it done as quickly as possible. There's no long-term vision. And when they're finished, they're gone. The aid agencies and you know, stay there and they try and work with the communities after the projects are finished. But Afghanistan also needs investment. I mean, Afghans are born merchants. I mean, they're, they're, they're entrepreneurs. They, they, they know what money is. And, um, and very often, I mean, there are some of the women, for example, they cannot get loans larger than a couple of thousand dollars because of the way they have to get their brother's permission or their father's permission. And they want significant loans. I mean, if you're a man, you can get a loan for $100,000 or $200,000. But there are a number of women who are entrepreneurs and want to do business. And they can't go into the tea houses to discuss with the boys. Uh, they, they're handicapped in many ways. <clears throat> but also, as was in Africa, I think a lot of the women involved with projects tend to repay their loans much more effectively than, than do the men. I and mean, they're actually a better investment. Uh, and this is the sa what has happened with micro loans in Afghanistan. So, um, but it's not easy. And I think we just have to resign ourselves that we can help, but we can't do it for them. Yeah. Anyway, that's <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, um, you know, at the risk of sounding vulgar, I want to say again that uh, you really, if you enjoyed this talk, which I thought was fabulous, you should buy the book. And if you do, you can read about his uh, confrontation with Osama bin Laden, which he didn't talk about, but which is a great several pages. Uh, I can I can see the film script. Uh, uh, please look at the um, website for the bookstore to uh, find out about our upcoming events. And uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you.